everyone. Sorry we're a little bit late. It wasn't my clock this time. We had some technical issues. Uh, these things happen, so let's dive straight in. Welcome back to the Recruiters Hangout. We have got some fantastic guests here today, and I'm really grateful that they're taking their time to come on and talk to us and to you guys. Um, if you want to join in the show today, as always, please tweet hashtag RecHangout. Or alternatively, if you're on the Webinar Jam link, you've signed up, you can see on the right a little Webinar Jam chat window, you can ask questions. So I'm typing now, hello everybody, type your questions in there. There we go. Um, and thank you for waiting patiently, someone's just put that. Thank you very much. Um, the guest today, we are joined by, we are joined by Graham Hubert. Welcome back, Graham. Nice to have you back again, co-founder of Console Partners. Um, I'll let Graham talk a little bit about Console Partners and, and, and their international role. Um, we've also got a, a new guest today, Ross Eads, CEO of Horton International. Welcome, Ross, and we've got Darren Rymill. Thanks for coming on, Darren, CEO of Opus Professional Services Group. Um, so we look forward to hearing a bit about uh, how they expanded their businesses internationally, what they're doing now. Have they got some tips? Can they can they give us an indication of what you know what downfalls to avoid, especially in opening new offices in new countries and and so forth. Um, I will hand over to our regular host. I must always, I, I always forget this to say that I'm Louis Welcome from Colleague Software and we host this. I must remember that. Louise Triance is here as well, so you can keep an eye on Twitter from UK Recruiter. Our host is Alan Whitford from Abtech Partnership and RC Euro. And Mark Stevens also joins us uh, from Smart Recruit Online. Take it away, Alan. Alan. Thanks. Louis, and it is good that you finally uh, introduced yourself because at the moment you're covering up your colleague's sign behind you, so no one would know that's where you are. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, how to be successful and build a successful international recruiting business, probably the dream of a lot of people when they decide to walk out the door and start their own business. Uh, I think what might just get us started is if I asked our three main guest is to do a quick intro to themselves, and, and I'm going to go based on how it's laid across my screen. And I'm, I'm going to start with uh, with a new boy, uh, Darren. Um, welcome to the to the recruiters hangout. Um, who are you actually do? Um, hello, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, and nice to meet you, Alan. Yeah, I've um, so we're Opus Recruitment, uh, sorry, Opus Professional Services Group. The the main business in that group is Opus Recruitment Solutions, which is an IT recruitment business, um, which is primarily looking at the development um, sort of software space, uh, software development space. Um, we've got an uh, energy and utilities brand as well within the group. Um, uh, yeah, we set up in 2008 and we're now active in Sydney, Amsterdam and New York. Okay, that, that sounds international to me then, not a bad place. Um, Graham, what about you guys? What, what are you up to and where are you internationally? Hi Alan, so um, Console, uh, similar to Darren's company, we started in 2008. We're a tech staffing company, so we specifically uh, work in very niche uh, digital technology. Um, our international footprint consists of uh, having an office in the UK, which is our headquarters, and a subsidiaries in America. So our strategy has been to put um, uh, presence in North America. So on the west coast we're in Los Angeles, on the west coast and on the east coast we're in Boston. However, we are an international company, so we have customers in 55 different countries. So whilst we're primarily headquartered in the UK, only 35% of our, our business is based in the UK. Um, so America's quite a, it's a really interesting place to be based and do business and um, but there are some challenges with it as well and so I'm keen to share those experiences with you. That, that's great Graham and, and I, I'll, this will be the uh, the lesson for everybody it's Los Angeles not Los, not Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I know and it's Houston not Houston you know just those just those little tips about pronouncing American cities. Um, Ross uh, welcome to the show uh, okay. looks okay. like a beautiful day where, where you're sitting in the nice yeah. bright sunshine yeah. in your office. Um, what are you guys up to and, and whereabouts are you based at the moment? Okay, um, probably best if I give you a bit of sort of background of, of sort of my knowledge of, of international businesses. I, I've been in recruitment now 27 years, uh, currently spend 50% of my time as the, the group CEO of Horton International which is a global executive search firm 
operating across 28, uh, 28 different countries with 45 offices throughout those 28 countries, as well as acting as a, as a board advisor for a number of other staffing firms. But prior to that, I was CEO of two publicly quoted companies, one uh, Kellen Group, that was all UK, that was a turnaround, and another one which we took to the market, did an IPO on, which was Interquest Group. Um, but my first international experience was, was when I headed up um, a company called MPS Group for Europe. I was CEO for Europe and we had two main brands which probably most people will know of, uh, Modus being the IT brand and Badenoch and Clark being the accountancy and professional service ones. And, and both of those businesses, so as a group we had several offices around the world, New York, Dubai, um, and we opened up um, I think it was about eight offices in mainland Europe. Um, so probably the two main companies, Horton International and MPS Group, uh, is where I've had the most exposure to, to, uh, to international uh, recruitment. Okay, that, that's brilliant. So, boy, we sure have an awful lot of international experience here between the three of you guys. And, you know, obviously, Ross, you don't look old enough to have been in recruitment for 27 years, so uh, you must have started as a wee baby. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I was only I was 10. 10. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we thought. Uh, I, I guess the first question I want to pose to the panel before we get into those sort of nuts and bolts of what have you done to actually enable your business to really grow internationally. When you started out, your business is, was international always in the mindset, or did, you, or did that just sort of come later as the business started to grow? Uh, as you're still on, Ross, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Intent to become international? Okay. Um, um, well, with well, Horton, with the interesting thing with Horton is, is it's, it's executive search. Um, by the very nature of executive search firms, if you're dealing with multinational clients, you have to be part of an international group. So, um, you know, you have to make a choice at some stage as an exec search firm. Are you going to stay as a boutique? in your own domestic market, in your own country, or are you going to develop and support multinational clients? And, and, and to give you sort of certain examples, you, you, you know, um, there are large uh, companies who, or take one for instance in Brazil, who would want to recruit a vice president, but they would want you to search surrounding countries, so Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, probably even Mexico, um, to know that they're getting the best talent around those countries for this senior position in Brazil. So uh, I think in executive search, it, it's part parcel of if you want to grow, you have to be um, international. Mainstream sort of recruitment, whether it's professional services, um, my personal belief is that becomes a client-led opportunity where you deal with clients in the UK, they are multinational clients, and you tend to sort of grab hold of their shirt tails and, and, and follow them around the world. So that, that, that's been my, my experience. So, so pretty much you do what all of us in recruitment do is when the client says, could you possibly do something for me in Afghanistan? You say, of course I can, and then go figure out how to do it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Graham, what about you guys? Uh, you know, as you said, you, you've, you've got doing business in, what, over 40 or 50 countries. Was that when you sat there in the morning saying, I'm going to build console and we're going to be in 50 countries? Was that part of the dream? Yeah, we started off our, our strategy was um, to be an international staffing company. Um, both Mark and I, um, when we started the business, we have international um, clients and, and recruiting experience. One of the big things was that we really wanted to think big and start big right from the get-go. and having that international experience as individuals really made us drive that strategy knowing that we could work in specific tech markets and um, add value to customers. So it, immediately um, we, we started internationally and actually we did a lot in Europe and the Middle East first of all, winning big customers, um, big international brands and then pulling them back to the UK. Okay, thanks. And, and Darren, what about for you? Same thing, that you, you planned it right from the start or more happenstance? Yeah, well, yeah, well um, our, I mean, our story is slightly different in the sense that day one we did set out, you know, our, our company aim um, when we set up was very clear to become a global leader in 
niche and innovative recruitment solutions. So it was a day one ambition to become global, and we were based in Bristol, and it's hard to be a global leader of anything um, and be based in Bristol, you know, and so we'd, we'd never been outside of Bristol. So it was always our intention to, to scale it up. Um, unlike Graham and Consol, we kind of focused our efforts more intensively in the UK, and it's only recently, um, probably in the last 12 months, that we started looking further afield and outside of the, the UK. Um, we took the attitude of trying to, I mean, we're certainly not dominating a market, but trying to penetrate a market deeper. Um, there's no right or wrong way, that was just our, our tactic. So we opened up, we had Bristol, Bristol grew, we opened up London. But obviously, of course, to become a global leader, we needed to look outside of that. And last year we opened up Sydney, um, very quickly opened up um, Amsterdam, and as I said, so we're now in New York as well, um, with a with a presence starting in Los Angeles. So it was really a case of stick to what we know initially, um, and then it was always the plan, but it wasn't from a customer-driven standpoint. It was from a, a strategic, let's take the next step forward because we feel we're ready. And we also, and obviously, it's, it's important to have the right people in place that will go and set up the office and, and all the rest of it. Well, it sounds to me like we've got a good mixture of approaches. I think my own experience when I first came to the UK in recruitment, I ended up working for a company that had an office in Amsterdam. And I kind of got the feeling it was initially client led that they were there. They were, you know, they'd been contractors. They stayed in Amsterdam and almost became, hey, we love Amsterdam. Let's have an office here. We must be now in international recruitment you know, because we're in Amsterdam. Um, so I think there's, I, I guess for our audience, there's probably not one answer, um, you know, the, the, the reasoning, initial reasoning behind it. But certainly I think it, it feels to me there must be a theme of research and preparation and, and building your strategy and tactics that would, I think, cross across all of your different reasons for being there. And, and you talked about this a little bit, Darren, just now that, you know, you had a strategy to become international but you had to work out what the tactics were to do that. And I guess, you know, right, Bristol to London, that's like going international, really. Um, you know, <laughs> I could say that as someone who lives in the Southwest. Um, but where did you start in terms of doing that research and preparation to get ready to kind of build that expanding network? Yeah, well, I mean, it sounds obvious, but talk to people that have got experience of, of doing things, you know. So it's, I mean, it's, it's probably the most obvious thing to say, but I think there's plenty of people that don't take that step. You know, I've had conversations in the past with people that said, oh, we set up in wherever, and it was a disaster. And then you sort of take their story along, and it's like they just found themselves there with that one day. Um, so we, everywhere we've been, we'd like to have some local knowledge and local presence in the market. And that the research done, there's a, quite a bit of research done behind that. Um, you then have to pick through the information you get because, for example, when we opened up Sydney, I went out to Sydney and everybody told me, the market's saturated, don't come out here, you've missed the boat, it's terrible, you're going to lose money. Um, and actually, it's far from that. You know, we're, we're experiencing that Sydney as a marketplace is particularly good for us. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's picking up the, the, the good bits of advice. Of advice. Um, but definitely speak to as many people as you can that have, that have walked in those, uh, you know, walk those paths that you want to go down. Is I think is the best starting point. Well, Ross, I guess that mirrors. You know, you had experience. Your clients took you there. Um, what did you do about then looking at the sort of research and preparation, and, and what, particularly what you might have to do around investment to actually follow them into those international territories and, and set up offices? Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Two, no, two things. Two, but, two things that, that reminds me. Reminds one, me. one, we had a setup in Holland, and we were supplying IT contract staff into Frankfurt, so into the financial markets in Frankfurt. And the, um, I mean, what what eventually happened there was once we got up to the stage of I think it was circa thirty contractors, it became evident that we needed a local presence. So that was a great way to do it because you've already got revenues, you've already got people working, you know, contractors working in Frankfurt and, and it made it very low cost to um, just open up an office and, 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 and set it up. So that, that one was straightforward. Other ones haven't been as straightforward as that where um, a client has said, you know, if you want to still deal with us, you need to set up an operation in a, in a different country. Uh, and of course, not knowing the culture in that country, 
not knowing the labour leasing laws, um, led to quite a bit of research and, and having local advisors on the ground um, who could say to us, you know, this is what you need to do, you need this licence if you're going to trade, you need maybe to have a sponsor if you're going to operate in that country and how do you make sure your taxes are not in that country and in the UK. So, so there were a host of things that um, you know, we had to spend money on advisors to, to, to help us. So, um, but, but I'm really pleased that we did that, otherwise we would have blindly followed the client into a new country and probably fallen flat on our face because you know, I'm sure we could have delivered the staff they want, but, but all the infrastructure and culturally understanding how things work would have been a real disadvantage for us if we had not gone down this advisor route. Yeah, and I think, uh, Graham, it's probably similar for, to you. I mean, like Ross, I, mean, I was involved in that contractor market in the early 80s, and, and sometimes it was like the Wild West in terms of, you know, who was getting paid where and how. And, you know, there's some, there some quite interesting challenges of finding out the regulations um, and making sure, in, and as you said, uh, Ross had licenses. But Graham, you had experience. You've opened up offices before. How did you get that local um, knowledge, local expertise, that legal side, the financial side? Uh, did you find some local people on the ground? Did you try and do it remote? What, what approach did you take? Well, I think, I think, I think the starting point for us was um, it's, it starts for us with client demand, um, similar to what Ross talked about. And so when we went to California, um, that client demand led really the starting place of should we should we be there? Um, the LA tech scene is our markets are very very hot in the LA tech tech scene, and many of our European customers have offices in California. So that was the starting place. Um, and then what we did was really just to see if we could work those remote territories from the UK to see if we can make it work. So that was the first point that that we started at. And then after that, absolutely, it starts with can you build more client relationships to see if you know, there's a potential to invest and spend money in building out this, this uh, international office. And then comes along the thing, things around compliance and visas and set up costs, um, insurance. Obviously, in the US, compliance, insurance, you, know, you really got to get that right. Um, hiring, who will lead the office. Um, that's the critical element for us. Is it was it somebody that we knew and trusted, and it's the same for Boston as well. Or did we want to go and hire locally to lead that? And figuring those things out are important. Um, but one of the things that we did, as I said at the beginning, is we've we've worked in lots of different countries. Our where we are on our journey and our strategy overall is to really invest in being in countries where there's client demand, candidate demand that we can make make a success and put significant headcount into as opposed to having lots of offices all around Europe or all around the world where we may get to you know, one to five people as a satellite. We really want to invest in that territory and build significant business operations in, that, in those territories. So in terms of headcount, we're at um, 30 people in the US um, and we're going to build that out quite, quite heavily. Um, and part of that is around a mix of local staff and um, relocating people from HQ. So. Um, one of the things that we had in our favour was Mark, who's uh, my business partner and co-founder. Mark, whilst he's, he's British, um, is green card holder and spent seven years previously working in California. So we had a network and we were able to um, exploit that and get up and running pretty quickly. Well, I think it's extremely sensible. I guess one of this, in a sense, is we have a very strong and robust recruitment industry here in the UK. There's a pretty similar sized industry in the U.S., so it's not like there aren't any recruiters, you know, in the U.S. I mean, I got my start in New York, and you know, there was lots of recruiters in New York. And as and as um, we just heard from from Darren when he got to Sydney, people were saying, "Well, what are you coming here for? We're ramped here. There's, there's no shortage of recruitment companies." How do you look at that challenge when you want to go into a new territory in Boston in the tech scene? You know, it's probably got some of the best tech recruiters in the world trying to recruit that valley outside of Boston. Um, that would seem a pretty, you know, like, you know, basically diving straight into the center of, of where it's pretty ramped already. How did you adjust your sort of thinking around that? Uh, we didn't have to. Our uh, markets are really, really buoyant, Alan. Um, and 
Um, it's all around markets that are candidate driven. And when we started in Los Angeles, um, we started with a perm strategy. And so we had uh, an investment fund uh, for that office. Um, but we got off to such a flying start, we didn't need to touch any of the investment. It hit profitability very, very quickly inside um, the first quarter. And um, the way that we approach the market, our, our recruitment process techniques that we've always trained and uh, delivered in the UK, we were able to replicate. And um, that was very successful. And Boston was the same. Actually, in Boston, we had probably a bigger crossover of um, um, some of our existing UK customers. But Boston's been the same. I think it's about picking the right markets. And for us, those are candidate-driven markets. Our, our markets are really hot as well, that tech scene that we work. So uh, we haven't had any challenges around that, thankfully. So, so it sounds like you guys have got the right idea. We know our, our clients are going to drag us into these markets. We've done a little bit of strategy about it. Um, but I think, uh, Graham, I'd like to take one of your thoughts out to the other two guys. It's this building the teams that trust factor. Am I going to ship a guy out from here? Am I going to buy, hire someone locally? If I do, do I trust him? Even if I ship a guy out from here, um, do I actually trust him not to go native once he gets to LA or Sydney? Um, you know, Darren, did you have that thought when you opened Sydney? Did you send people out from here? Did you go local right away? Um, sorry, a mixture of both. The, the, the internet's not great. I don't know if anyone else is picking up on a uh, a bit of a delay in the thing, so I don't know if it's me or, or everyone, but um, hopefully you can hear me. I um, We did a combination of both. We, we sent a couple of guys out that were proven Opus um, UK uh, employees that we knew were would be able to like maintain our values and the way of doing things, but we also took an experienced recruiter who was on the ground there to lead the office, and I think that's important that you invest in the, in the culture and the you know, just the, the local market, I think it's really important that you, you, you give yourself a chance to embrace what they're doing locally. Um, it doesn't mean then you just copy that. Um, so, for example, in Sydney, I was having a conversation earlier on with somebody, and they said, how do you find the culture in Sydney? Isn't it just like coffee culture? And I sort of smiled because I know what he's getting at. Is everyone wants a meeting. Everyone's happy to have a meeting with you and have a drink of coffee and almost like the recruiter's KPI in Sydney seems to be, let's go for a coffee together. Um, and that's not really the way that I think recruitment should be done. And, you know, there's an argument to be said that I've heard from other people, I'm not saying this is necessarily my view, um, that, you know, Sydney's a great graveyard for not very good recruiters to leave the UK um, and go out there and take a, take a lifestyle job, you know, where they've got the sun and they get a nice big basics, the way recruitment, recruiters are often remunerated over there is different. You go out there, and I think we so we wanted to embrace the the concept of meetings. You know, here in the UK, it's much faster pace often, whereby it's very much the telephone's your greatest asset. But over there, it's very much a case of well, actually, there's a there's a a buy-in to the the relationship side a little bit more, whereby they want to meet you, they want to see what's going on. So it's almost a case of like we'll go and meet people, but let's meet them, explain that us to do our job effectively probably means that we go out and actually spend time in the office, you know, and then we'll meet them again after we've either placed them or placed their job, as opposed to daily coffee updates of, of nothingness. Um, so that was a cultural thing. That I think we took something that they did well, meetings, and, and uh, put our own stamp on it. Um, and if that's a very positive example. <laughs> but, uh, well, that... That's true. And Ross, I'm going to come to you in with a theme based on some of the stuff that, uh, that Darren talked about. Uh, just do a quick reset for our listening and viewing audience. This is hashtag Rec Hangout, the Recruiters Hangout, um, hosted by uh, Louis at Colleague Software, Louis at UK Recruiter, and Mark at uh, Smart Recruit Online. And I'm Alan Whitford from AppTech Partnership. I'm taking a lesson from Louis on there about selling who I am. We've got a great panel of, of uh, Ross Eads, Graham Hubert, and Darren Rymel. We're talking about how to build uh, your international recruiting business. Um, we had some pretty good lessons about this initial thoughts, the strategy about getting it started. Is it client-led or just a, a personal late-night bedroom desire? Um, and it feels to be more client-led. Uh, one of the things that we just talked about there and that Darren brought up is that cultural impact when you get into a new location or a new country whether it's the type of people that you're hiring or how the 
your clients might expect the business to be served different than we might do it back here in Old Blighty. Uh, how have you uh, sort of planned for and dealt with that? Um, so for me, Alan, yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, just to add on what the, the other guy said, to, 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 to really set something up, you know, thousands of miles away from home, my, my, my sort of experience has been that you need to quickly get up to some sort of critical mass. So um, you, you've got to get four people in there very quickly and hopefully up to ten very quickly. So you've got that sort of strength in numbers if a couple of people defect or... Um, but of course you do need enough business coming through to support those. So what my view has always been a minimum of four, get up to ten quickly. Um, with Baden Ock and Clark, uh, which was you know quite a few years ago now, um, when that was set up, seven, I think it was about seven people went out from the UK to set it up and, and, and live in New York and then started to recruit locals a, around that core team of seven. Um, but there's always this concern, I think, of trust and reliance. You know, you're relying on that, that operation to work and to work to the same standards standards and consistent standards as you do in the, the head office. Um, and if it is possible, I, I've, uh, and you are taking on a number of local people, uh, I'm a big fan of shared ownership. So you can have local people... Um, in senior positions, but they have a bit of skin in the game, so they have a little bit of um, equity in the business, which I, I felt, and it's been sort of proven, that, that they, they work far harder and protect that company when it's thousands of miles away if they've actually got a bit of a stake in it, instead of we're just hiring people as what I would call hired hands to run that operation, and if something goes wrong, you got to jump on an aeroplane and, and get out there quickly. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I think that's it's a big help, and it's answered Bola Yusuf, one of our viewers, had that exact question on whether we're shipping some great recruiters from here out, or are we, um, you know, hiring locally? And it feels, from your perspective, it's about a, it's a mix. Um, and, 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 and say, what about you? Yeah, yeah. you guys and, and, approach and, and, that. Russ, Russ, being really open and transparent, it's tough at home as well. You know, so it's not just expanding internationally. It suddenly makes your life easier in the hiring front. It's tough high men abroad. Um, but I think for, for us, we've done it with a blend. Similar to what Ross said, I think, you know, we've experienced the same. You have to get up to critical mass very quickly. And for us, it's not about putting one or two people into an office and seeing if uh, you get a return off that investment. It just doesn't work. And so in both, like, both Los Angeles and um, Boston, we led with um, someone from the UK business, a number of people from the UK business actually in, in LA, um, and then we hired um, local talent immediately. So we pre-hired, and then kind of day one of launching those offices, um, we had a bunch of people starting. So in LA, I think we had nine or ten people day one, and Boston was six or seven. Um, so, so getting that right was really important. And that was also done with the support of our uh, learning and development team from the UK headquarters. So we hired a mix of experienced and entry level, and we rolled out our training programs. So there was a full induction, uh, full learning and development program set up for both offices, so that when the local staff came in, it, it was like coming into our London office, which had been established for obviously a long time. So that was really important. Um, I think the other thing in terms of the attraction for the local staff is it's almost like joining a startup but part of a big successful global business and that gives a lot of kind of strength to what you're trying to do and attraction for people coming on board so um, yeah that, that was pretty good and we, we moved a bunch of people out from from the UK we believe that's important similar to what Ross and to Darren said as well um, having that kind of the way we do things the DNA of the way we do things is important um, okay. yeah yeah good Mark, I just want to come over to you for a second. You know, you've built a recruitment business, you've built a technology business that supports recruitment. I'm guessing international is part of the aspiration there as well. Does all of this make sense in terms of the things that you would be doing to to take uh, Smart Recruit, you know, international? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's I'm, interesting. I'm, oh, I've got this echo. Um, it's interesting trying to put this into context. Um, I mean, come from a recruitment agency background. 
and thinking back on the sort of international opportunities that we had, um, they tended to come more from large clients we were working with in the UK that had requirements abroad or were looking to recruit UK people and take them over there on secondments. Um, but I don't really think that we ever had intentions of opening up an international office, um, but were probably interested in looking at whether or not there was opportunities to um, run a more commercially viable business by recruiting abroad. Um, so I'm interested to hear what the guys have got to say about you know, how they align themselves with fees. If they work in the Middle East, for example, do the fees go up? Um, and and, I, and it, I'm sorry if I've missed this already, but you know, when, when, when you're first, you first get those opportunities to work with a client internationally, do, um, do you start working in the UK? Do you fill the first few jobs? Do you put some money in the bank with that client and have the security of knowing that there's a trading relationship there and almost say, well, we've, we've got X amount in the bank now from that relationship and we'll use that to fund a, a, an office startup over there? Or, or, or is it, you know, you have to have more investment capital behind you than that? And uh, uh, because I'm sure there's a, a lot of smaller organizations here today that are looking at this opportunity and, and think, well, they wouldn't have the, the commercial backing to go and set up an office with 10 people in it from day one. You know, how, how would they do it, you know, sensibly and gradually if they've perhaps got a client they're working with right now, they filled a couple of jobs, maybe in the Middle East or in America. What, what would the, your advice be around the next steps there? Would they go looking for funding or just take your time, just try and work from the UK as much as possible? I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, Alan, about what we're doing on the software side, but maybe I'll come back to that. Mark, we, we did exactly that. So we started with um, working with customers in the US before investing in the territory. So um, that, that meant that we could, when we were ready to invest in the territory, we already had some history and some trading history and some understanding of how it worked. Um, we did exactly that. So we started with. Uh, oh, if you guys can hear me, got feedback. Uh, carry on, Graham. Yeah. So, no. So I was just, I was just saying that um, we started doing exactly what you suggested, Mark, which was working with customers remotely and then investing in the territory. Uh, we wouldn't. We, we absolutely wouldn't only work with a customer in the UK before working with them in the in the Middle East or Europe or Germany or Netherlands. Um, we don't we don't look at it that way. We work with customers internationally from the UK, and that's really about making decisions on are they the right company to be working for? Do they pay good fees? Do they, you know, are they big? Are they stable? Are they going to pay your bills? So, so it's a it's a sort of a, a reactionary thing more so than a proactive thing. Saying well, we want to have an office in the Middle East. It might well be that you've got trading history, and then you think, well, this makes sense to sort of you know to capitalise on this. Yeah, for us it was. It was. Um, I think what we found was that. There are a bunch of countries we could have gone to. I think what you find in most tech staffing companies, I say the majority there are exceptions that most tech staffing companies like us tend to go to Europe first, either Netherlands or to Germany. That's the obvious place to go, particularly if you've got revenue stream. But we just felt that there was more value, our customer base, uh, probably tougher to go to America and get that right, and therefore had a little bit more value. Um, and also we had some knowledge of how to do that, so we proactively looked for America over uh, Europe or the Middle East, um, but we had revenue there first. Yeah, I think Mark, just just to sort of touch on that as well. Um, it, to, to me, you sort of first of all say, why the hell are we going to this country? You know, and 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 if the reason is because a client has asked you or two clients have asked you, then 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 the next step has to be very quickly understanding what the potential is from those two clients in the new country and then spiraling out from there what is the potential for your business out there and if if it's purely those two clients then you know you're not going to need an office of 10 people very quickly um, but if you map out that market and you can see that very quickly with the help of those two clients you can use them as reference sites and uh, spiral out very quickly then for sure, you're going to look at a 10-man operation quite quickly, which then brings in, I think, your initial question of how the hell do you get the money to invest in that? Um, so the, it, it becomes a whole package, I think, where one thing's linked to the other, and you know what's right for one company, might, the speed of growth for one company might not be right for another. So um, I think you do have to juggle um, the, the cost and the investment 
and how how aggressively you want to grow that business in that country from from the very early days or, or even before you land. Um, you know, you hear people talk about this land and expand. Well, yeah, great, but what's the potential to expand? That has to be really understood um, before you start shipping people into it um, and you know just expecting it to grow because it's a big it's a major economy. So a question I guess to, to do all of you then and it touches a bit on what Mark talked about is the whole fees piece and, and structure of charging. Certainly I know when we moved Abtech out into the Lux when I first moved there they didn't even know what search was. So, you know, that was, that was a starting point of the mindset. Obviously, we've moved on from that over the years. But we seem to get kind of rigorous here in the UK as a structure. And that's my warranty structure, guarantee structure, and that's it. And we get to Holland or the US or Benin or wherever we get to, and they might not really understand that concept. So how do you, as a manager of the business, align the thinking of your your other management team on, hey, you know, it's a difference here to think about it. Ross? I didn't quite get the last part of that, Alan. Can you just repeat the last part, please? So how do you work then with your management team to get their company organized in terms of understanding that there's different charging mechanisms in these different locations we go to and align that with what might be our more traditional means of driving revenue? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's you know to me it's a very interesting thing the cultures and I've spent quite a bit of time on this um, and, and I tell you what what brought it home to me when the bribery act came into force in, in the UK um, I, you know, I'm not going to name countries around the world but there are a certain amount of countries in the world which um, you know sweeting in a deal is acceptable. I mean, that's their culture, that's the way they work and, you know, being in the UK under th restrictions like the bribery or having guidelines and legislation, you know, you have to make a choice. Do you actually want to trade in that country or not? Because you can't change it. If, if that's the culture, um, you either go in there and work within that culture or you choose to say, no, that's not us. So that that's an extreme of, of a difference of a culture. but. I just think it's vitally important that um, you know you don't lose the quality and the consistency of delivery throughout your business. But very early on, you have to understand what the hell is going on with the culture. You know, um, and, and you, you mentioned sort of Amsterdam earlier. There's there's certain countries where um, you know they're very well looked after in things like sick pay. Um, and, and employment law is very different and they're, they're on a consultancy agreement and you know you try and go through a redundancy process and it's an absolute nightmare so all those things need to be fully understood um, and then to me you start to understand what's acceptable in a country for fees for commissions, for salaries, um, and it, it might sound like it's a lot to work out, but if you want to get it right, like a lot of things, you've got to put in all the groundwork first um, and lift up every stone you possibly can to understand exactly what you're letting yourself in for. Um, and then there's no surprises, you know, and you've got far better chance of ticking all these things off in priority order and getting it right and hitting the ground running. I think you're right that research is incredibly difficult. You're quite right. The first time I was in Holland and found out they paid 13.85 months for essentially what was 11 months work, you know, for the system. You know, when you've been, did you find there was a big difference in the salary structures? Well, you talked one thing about higher bases, but what about the, the fee structure? Was that broadly similar to what you were doing in the UK before you went down? Um, um, sorry, sorry. To, I was going to uh, say, you, you wait, try wait, that wait. and then Darren, if you could come in on that as well. Sorry, Darren. Go sorry. Darren. You, want, you want me? <laughs> okay. You want, um, you want so, so fee structure. Well, I think I mean, your fee structure, I think everybody seems to look at the marketplace for what they should take, where they should take their fee from. And I think 
firstly, I think your fee should be based on the quality of service you deliver, not what everyone else is charging. So, for example, Lamborghini don't set their prices on what Kia are charging for their cars. Um, so I think you need to define what it is you're actually bringing to the marketplace and the value of that service. Um, once you do that, I think then you need to educate your client that this is not a Kia, just stick with that example, this is a Lamborghini. I, you know, I don't think Opus are necessarily pitching ourselves at that point, but probably we're a Mercedes if we were going to be saying, you know, what, what do we bring? And I think that then sets your benchmark for what you're doing because you can't just go around the world sort of saying, hello, we're going to offer a completely different level of service here because you want to play a different price. I think you say, this is the level of service we offer. This is what we bring. Are you interested in this? And in our case, because we try and put a, a premium on our service and we say, actually, we're not just going to send you the least bad CV that happens to get sent to an advert for this job, we're going to actually go out and add value to your recruitment process, then they understand that and they don't, and people don't mind paying a fee for good things and when they, when they can see it. So I think that forms, part of, that forms part of your offering in any case because let's just say there's a country that charge 5% recruitment, well we can't open there because we can't do what we do for 5% of a, of a margin, you know, and, and I don't know any good recruitment companies that, that can, quite frankly. Um, so whilst the US market may say, well, we'll offer you a 20 or a 25% fee, whereas in the UK, I sometimes feel that we're banging our heads against a brick wall to try and justify that 20% mark, you know, sort of like compared to what other competitors are doing. I think it's a case of if your service is good enough, then the fee will stand up, um, as opposed to letting the, the tail wag the dog. It needs to be it needs to All right, I appreciate that. Now, Graham, you're in a lot of different countries. I'm sure there's been a lot of conflict about what fee structure our standard might be. How have you dealt with that? Um, I think similar to, to what Ross and Dan uh, Similar said. To, to what Ross and um, um, You should know in advance. It's all part of the research phase. And knowing you know what the fees are likely to be, you, you, you have to know that before you invest in the territory. And by having the strategy that we had, which was to start working in those markets before investing in putting an office location, we knew that in advance. But there are subtle differences. So, for example, in Germany, notice periods are much longer than they are in North America, and so. Uh, that could affect your cash flow. A three-month typical notice period in, in Germany means your lead time to collect your cash is much longer than it is in America where pretty much it's a week to two weeks notice before you can raise an invoice. So um, understanding that is important, but I think ultimately, Alan, it all comes out in the research phase that the guys have talked about is so important. Great. Guys, we've got about 15 minutes or so left, and uh, I think, uh, you know, Darren, you've got to shoot off in a couple of minutes. Um, Ross needs to head off. Yep. To sorry, head off. Ross has got to shoot off. Sorry if he's not already gone. Um, Ross, before you go, one final question for you. Biggest challenge to set up internationally? Biggest challenge? Biggest challenge. Uh, well, I mean, it's people. I mean, it's people. It's got to be got getting to be right getting people, people on the ground. ground. Obviously, you've done all the research, got the good clients, um, but, but if, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but if you haven't got the right people, and they're thousands of miles away, then um, it's just not going to happen. That sounds about right. You can go off to the board meeting now. <laughs> Hopefully your connection there is better than some of ours. But appreciate your co your uh, contribution, and I'm sure Louise will have your contact details in her post-event blog for people that want to get back to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, thank you. Everyone. Yeah, appreciate that. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Ross. Right. So we've had a couple of good questions coming in from, uh, from the webinar jam, guys. Um, and I think one of them is about, uh, Perry has brought up about an international competitor called TopTal, which uses software engineering to hiring and screening developers. How are you actually using technology, if you are, to actually screen in in those candidate-driven markets? And, and I'll, I'll come to you first on that, Graham, because you've talked a lot about being in that tech scene. What, it, what technology are you using to really screen in people, or is it still back to the gut feel of a good recruiter? Uh, I think if, if if there's a bit of a blend on that, Alan, if you know your markets and you're expert in your market and you train your people in that market and you're able to make certain um, uh, screening decisions based on what somebody's been doing. But there are 
you know, communities out there and you know, GitHub, for example, where you can look at recommendations, but also you can develop tests, etc., in conjunction with your clients. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question was, but if the question was around disintermediation and um, whether or not uh, websites or computers are going to take the role of, of recruiters, that's been around for a long time. I think we all remember when kind of Monster launched and we thought this is the death of recruiters. Um, and then obviously version two of that is LinkedIn. I think there's always a value for recruiters. Um, but in terms of specific technology, we're not using specific technology to filter out or to screen um, uh, tech skills. I think it's just the market knowledge we have and the investment in working in those specific markets and not being a generalist that helps us. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Well, I'll push that back to Perry and see if you feel. But you're right, I mean, everything in the bib this week is about how computers are going to replace us all doing everything. They and are, it looks like the guy is just stuck an iPad on a stick. You know, so, yeah, they're not going to replace them. I'm not yeah, sure not we're worried about us. robots yet. <laughs> um, I guess you know, we've got about 10 minutes to go, guys. A uh, final reset. This is the REC Hangout. We've been talking to um, Ross, Graham, and Darren about challenges and strategy planning for building an international business. And I think the, the sort of final theme is we, we asked Ross just before he had to, to shoot off. Particularly for some markets like this, less regulation. As you're expanding internationally, um, Graham, what do you see as those those main challenges that you really have to be thinking uh, about and overcoming every day? Uh, yeah, I think if I'll probably answer this um, kind of from my personal perspective and probably from Mark's perspective, given that he's, he's based in America now, and I think um, one of the things that that Mark would probably talk about is so focused on getting the business up and running and, and all the day-to-day -day requirements of um, making that US business success, a success is that it can distract you from what's happening at HQ. Um, a lot of people said to Mark and I when we decided, right, we're going to launch a US office and Mark was going to go to America and be based in California and uh, have an office on the beach in Santa Monica. Um, number one, you know, how come I've got the short straw, I'm still based in the city, but also number two, what would that do for... Uh, for our relationship, we worked very closely together for, for four or five years, and um, that was potentially a challenge, but actually it hasn't been a challenge. We talk every single day at quarter past three without fail, and um, that was one of the perceived challenges that we were warned lots about, but that hasn't been a challenge. It actually works really well. It Mark would say distract you from HQ. I think one of the things that we found was the early success that we ha we've had in the early days of opening those offices gets you quite bullish. And um, you just got to make sure that you ha keep that in check and that you continue to kind of do your, your research and that you don't get ahead of yourself to make sure you get a good trading period under your belt before you invest more. Um, obviously, pitfalls and dangers. The big one for us in the US is compliance and insurance for obvious reasons, particularly in California. Um, do something wrong, risk of getting sued, and, um, you know, the impact of that on the whole company is 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 uh, could be pretty scary. So that kind of degree of separation and having the right company structure is important. Um, time zones can be challenging, but I think particularly for out in the regions. So for for us, for Los Angeles and and the Boston offices to feel part of the group. So we use video a lot. We use video to um, um, to make sure. That companies are connected so we do a monthly sales meeting where all three businesses connect via video and share successes and challenges and experiences um, that's been really 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 helpful and then finally I think um, if we look at our experience with the U US the financing particularly in a contract book really expensive in the US and whilst you might be a bigger global brand you treat it as a startup particularly in the US and so there's, there's costs there um, so yeah, those are some of the challenges that, that, that we've faced. Thank you, Graham, and thanks for the candor. Um, I guess, you know, Darren, you know, uh, only an eight hour time difference that uh, Graham has to deal with the LA must seem like a pleasant, pleasant surprise for you as opposed to dealing with the folks out in Sydney. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> I would, really, I would, really, I would concur with what he says in terms of you know the time zone is a challenge. I mean, we've got you know we've got a guy out in LA at the moment. We've got um, an office in New York. 
UK and then we go right out to Sydney. So we've effectively between sort of LA and, and Sydney got almost a 20 hour time time difference at times. So I'm going to bed, you know, fielding questions from New York, waking up at 4 or 5 a.m. fielding questions from Sydney, which which is fun, you know, it's, it's, it's great, it's all part of it. So I think you then need to structure not just your day, but the business from HQ, as, as uh, Graham said, so that it's set up to deal with that because, you know, that people, you become more of a 24-hour operation and it's not just about being available 8, 10, 12 hours a day, it's always being available. And I think that's, that's a huge challenge to, I'm sure Graham finds it, to not constantly be talking to somebody about something. Um, which, which is which is great. Um, you know, it's a nice challenge to overcome. For, for me, um, I'd agree with everybody about the people. I think that's a huge challenge. I mean, you know, getting the right people in place, as Graham says, is not just important in the in the the offices when you go internationally. It's hugely important at the start when you when you're starting your business, wherever you're starting it. I mean, it's just a, always going to be a challenge. Um, but I mean, go go back to my to stick on my car theme from earlier. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge is probably sort of like to quote Henry Ford, you know, whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. And I think so many people talk themselves out of actually even having a go at it. And I think that's the, the single biggest hurdle to overcome. If you listen to people, they'll tell you a million reasons why everything you're thinking of is doomed to failure and you're just never going to make a go of it. There's no point in going to the United States, that's got recruiters. Um, and if I take it back to when I first set up my IT recruitment business, um, so way back when, it was like, you know, Darren, there's, a, there's IT recruiters out there. What are you doing? I'm like, well, of course they're out there. But it's just about presenting yourself in a different way and a different offering and adding something to the, to the market. And I'm just, I know like, with, with the guys, what Graham does at Consul, I know, you know they're, they're respected in the marketplace, as hopefully are we, and that carries something for you. Um, so it's... So it's trust in what you do, you know, believe that you actually have something worthwhile offering and then have a go at it. And don't worry about all the people that will tell you you can't. Worry about, you know, your own product and the fact that you can. And I think that's the, the single biggest challenge that, that we make sure that we get over. And as soon as your mindset is in that right space, then you've got a much better chance of succeeding than if you think you're not going to. I mean, that, that's brilliant. I can't wait for Louise's blog, by the way, to bring in Lamborghini, his key is in uh, uh, Mercedes um, and Ford's all into one article. I'm going to be interested in how she brings it all in for you. Um, and Louis wants her to put a jag into it as well. So we could have a car blog before we're done. Uh, I guess the, the final piece for me is, is that how this technology is helping you guys it's not working for you alan <laughs> i know it still might be working for me, but then the facts transformed our business and then it was it got internet when it works and video conference calling so in one sense it feels like it enables us to be do more internationally but at the same time we do have that challenge as you've just um as you've just talked about darren about this all of a sudden, you're now a 24-7 business. And to be honest, the person in Hong Kong or Sydney or LA might figure out what time it is here in the UK. And we get that call at four in the morning or, or you know, whenever it might be. How have you tried to manage that technology piece to, to work on the comms to actually allow you guys to actually have a life yourself? Um, Darren, I'll start with you and then, uh, uh, and then over to, to Graham on that piece. How, how do you have a life yourself and not work 24-7 be, because of what technology gives? Okay, um, yeah, well, you can always switch your phone off. I don't do that. I mean, that would be the, the, the first starting point. Um, but, I mean, there's an assumption there that you want to do that. And I mean, this is the, this is the thing, you know, I, I, I may be a freak, but actually I love you know, my work forms part of my life and I actually love my job and it's it's kind of my hobby. And as sad as, as, sad as this is, you know, I, uh, I actually don't mind it. You know, my, my wife might have a greater issue with it um, at times, you know, when, when we're on holiday and I'm still working. So for me, it's not a problem. Um, I actually enjoy that. You can get trapped into feeling like it's important to respond to every tweet or every LinkedIn message or every email straight away. But I've not been sucked into that just yet. You know, I'm still, I still sort of have a, a some kind of 
barometer of priorities in my head. Um, you know, and if I'm now with my kids doing something with my kids, I'm not one of these Facebook dads that is scrolling and, and doing stuff on my phone. I'm uh, I'm engaged with my kids. So it's about you know prioritizing what you want to do when you want to do it and not letting it dictate. And is that the answer you want? Well, hey, I don't want any helps explain it. And, and um, Graham, I think it's really kind of you to have you know, not have Mark get up at five in the morning for those calls that you have, that he's actually at seven o'clock with his breakfast tea for that for that call. Um, but how about the rest of those cons? Because obviously five o'clock in California, we hope to be asleep by then, or maybe you don't sleep. How, how does how does that work for you? Well, actually, well, actually, I absolutely turn my phone off because I think it's really important. And um, there's no way I'm taking a call from Mark at four o'clock in the morning it can it can wait a couple of hours. Nothing that that's that urgent. And if it is really urgent, he has my home phone number and he can call me. And I may or may not answer it. He's got a life, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I turn my phone off. I'm not ashamed to say I turn my phone off. Uh, if Mark really needs to get hold of me, call me at home. And then I'm you know I'm pre pretty much will probably let it go to the answer phone. But how we're using technology is an interesting one because when we started out, Alan particularly if you look at it from a CRM system perspective, when we launched it the US, we had uh, the US business dialing in over VPN to our London servers to try and work on a shared database, and it didn't work. And um, um, it just was clunky. It didn't work for our guys in the US. Um, we still provide IT support remotely. We're getting some critical mass, so we need to look at that. But in terms of the CRM, we've moved it to the cloud. Um, some Salesforce platform now, and that's been important. Um, we use a lot of video, so if you look from a learning de and development perspective, our director of learning development, Russell, and his team are still coaching and training our um, staff members in Los Angeles and Boston and using video to do that in, in many of the instances. So video has been a game changer for us, and I don't believe you need to have the face time that, that you once needed, and it's made the world, it really has made the world a smaller place for us. Brilliant, and that's a great way for us to kind of end the session. I think we could probably talk about this for another two or three hours, but you guys have got to go make a living and start making calls to the other side of the world. Um, my friend, we just want to thank all of you and, and, and Ross as well for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with our audience and with us. Uh, Louis, I'm going to kick it back over to you um, and uh, let you do our wrap. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. That's a fantastic hangout. Sorry about a few technical issues, um, but I think we got we got our points across. So really useful. And we appreciate any feedback anyone has. Um, Louise will be doing the follow-up blog on the UK Recruiter blog, which will have all the highlights um, and link to a few other resources as well, and to the guys here to their um, blogs and Twitters and so forth. Um, We'll also be uh, following up with a slide share, as we always do, with the entire transcript of this Hangout, which I don't have to type myself anymore, because I'm going to get Christian, who was on it earlier, to type that up, the lucky guy. So um, so he's going to type that all up. And if you want to read through every single word that was said, or the highlights at least, that's a nice little, um, a nice little takeaway there. Um, I just want to do a little plug for um, a broadcast webinar we're uh, co-hosting with Social Talent next Friday on the 25th of September called The Director's Cut Outside Recruitment. Um, we've actually hosted this uh, last Thursday in the Barbican live uh, with a nice little studio audience and popcorn and ice cream and all that kind of thing. Um, and we are now broadcasting the edited edition next week, so anyone can sign up to that. Um, and I'll pop the link in on the left here. Our next Hangout is on the uh, 7th, I think. You'll check the Rec Hangout blog afterwards. It's on recruitment technology, so we'll be carrying on this discussion that Graham and Darren were talking about with technology, video, CRMs, where things are going. Try and make it a bit more interesting um, for you guys around technology because it can be quite dry. So we'll try and talk about you know where things are changing and what and bring on some technology companies like Broadbean um, and myself. I might have something to say as well. So um, you lucky people. Um, and of course, Mark Stevens will be here talking about what they're doing. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, uh, we'll see you again next time. Take care. Bye bye.